Uh, this morning, I want to make sure that we do just that. As you're sitting down and collecting your thoughts, I do want to run a couple of things by you now that it's 930. First of all, notes are available at the entrances. If, if we run out, then you'll have to share. We also have uh, copies of the book that we'll be uh, studying over the next month. I cut off the binding and put it in a binder, but that's what the book looks like. So let me encourage you, if you're interested in getting a little bit deeper than, well, quite a bit deeper than we'll be able to go, this is a, a pretty thick book for being such a thin book. Okay, it's great. It's called Knowing and Growing in Assurance of Faith. And it's $5 is the suggested donation to cover the church's cost. And they're available out there, uh, one, for, one per family. If you want to read it twice, then see me. I'll get you another copy. Uh, let's pray and let's, let's begin this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, not only for the gospel, but for the fact that you're gracious enough to allow us to know that we know that we know you. And Lord, I know that there are some in our midst that may struggle with this idea of assurance of salvation. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use the elder team over the next four weeks to be a means by which they are strengthened and encouraged in you. Lord, for this morning, I pray for Chris and for myself as we teach this morning that you would help us to, to say the right things and to, to encourage your people. Lord, most of all, we pray that you would be glorified by a fully assured, passionately faithful church. And we ask this to the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. We'll start with uh, a theme verse of sorts. As this morning, what we'll be asking are simply these two questions. Why is assurance important, and why don't we have it? Right? Those are the two questions that we'll be banking on this morning. Now, the, the main thing that I want you to see from the text this morning is that assurance is something that you can have. In 1 John 5.13, we find this. It says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, I want to pick a couple of things out of this verse for your edification and for your encouragement. First of all, notice this. These things I have written to you who believe. The book of 1 John was written to believers. Now, that's important, right? Because that's what we are. That's what I hope we are. We are believers. And so if it's written to us, the next question is this. What is the message? Well, here's the message. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. John wrote this book not just so that you would know the gospel, but he wrote it so that you would know that you know the God of the gospel. That's our heart for you as an elder team this year in this combined Sunday school class. We want to encourage you with the true knowledge that you know Christ. And so that's what we'll be focusing on in the next couple of weeks. Now, what do we learn from this observation? We learned this, that assurance is important. If an entire letter that was then included in the New Testament scriptures was written to give you assurance, it has to be a pretty important thing. And secondly, we see that assurance is attainable. John would not say, I wrote this so that you would know you have eternal life if knowing you had eternal life was impossible. Now, one more point by way of, of introduction, and then we'll tag out. This is going to be like a tag team wrestling match. You ever see a tag team wrestling match? Or I'm going to teach for a little bit, and then I'm going to tag, and Chris is going to come in, and then I'm going to get on the top rope, right? And then, no, probably not. Okay. <laughs> the holiness of God feels overwhelming. It feels overwhelming to those who can never know that they're saved by it. Let's just take that and think about that for a second. 
If God is holy, if God is pure, if he dwells in unapproachable light, and you don't know if you can stand before him forgiven, that very holiness that he has is the most frightening reality in the universe. Do you agree? To be a victim of his just wrath is the scariest thing in the universe. And so we must know that we will be able to stand before him clean, forgiven, saved. Did you know this, that Martin Luther, the reformer, was tormented by the holiness of God. He hated the holiness of God until he discovered justification by faith alone. Once he knew that he could stand before the God of the universe because of faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, what was once terrifying to him then became a source of great encouragement and sweetness. So this morning, we're going to ask these two questions. Why is assurance important? And why don't we have it? Tag. All right. Good morning. Uh, I think it's important, too, as, we, as I tag up here, too, to remind you that uh, when we talk about this in the class, we want to, Tom and I, Dom and I, Pastor Dom and I talked this class uh, to a couple of individuals in the back. We're not going to give you assurance. Your parents aren't going to give you assurance. Our church isn't going to give us assurance. The Holy Spirit of God, the scriptures, that, that's where we're going to get our assurance. So I want to just remind you of that. Fact. So why is assurance of faith? Well, there's two types of assurance. So, uh, and the book talks about this. Uh, it talks about it, a couple of different types, but there's basically two types. There's easy believism. I prayed that prayer. That happened in my life. Uh, I did that already. Um, I'm getting in. I'm getting into heaven. Uh, today's culture, they just have an emphasis on feeling, you know, sentimentalityism, uh, taking precedence even over belief. Well, I, I really feel that this is true. Uh, and feelings can't really be trusted, can they? They're fickle. Um, what do I feel like today? I might feel different tomorrow than I feel today. Um, you know, and it isn't about hearing a happy message, coming to a place like this on a Sunday morning and hearing something good that makes me, you know, tickles my ears, makes me feel good about myself as I leave. Um, it's about what's true and how I need to obey it, and, and more especially, how I need to obey Christ. So those in the easy believism camp, uh, basically they claim forgiveness without repentance. So, um, you know, again, I prayed the prayer, and I can live how I want. I got the fire insurance, I'm not going to hell, but I'm gonna live my life the way I want to. And that's not biblical truth. Um, they don't fear God, they don't hate sin, they don't uh, love Christ and obey him, and they don't pursue holiness. So these are some of the, kind of the marks that are the opposite of what would be true assurance. And then there's universalism, you know, this idea that everybody gets in. Well, everybody's going to heaven. Um, you know, how would, uh, you know, my God is a, a God who just forgives everybody. Um, that may be true, but that God is not the God of the Bible. Um, universalism is, the yeah, just the idea everybody gets to go in heaven regardless of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and people generally think that there are good people because they mistake comparing themselves with the worst sinner that they can think of. So, well, I'm not Hitler, I'm not Mussolini, I'm not, you know, whatever their most, uh, the, the politician that they don't like the most, so at least I'm not that guy. Um, but the true test is to compare ourselves with the holy God, evaluating ourselves in the light of God's law. Um, when we look at like something like the Ten Commandments and we think, have we lied, have we stolen, have we lusted? Uh, have we not honored God as we should? You know, we stand before God and we're lawbreakers, you know, we're deserving of death. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. So, you know, speaking about a universalism, and you look at the truth of the matter is that Jesus' death on the cross was effective for, to pay for the sins of the whole world. So, not universalism, but he died for the whole world, but it's only applicable 
for those who place their faith and their trust in him. And he provides forgiveness and we receive it. Um, we trust, you know, and I always think about this like in a parachute analogy. So we're all in a plane and the plane's going down and the, you know, whoever, the stewardess, the pilot, somebody says, you know, you need to put on the parachute. If you put on the parachute and jump out of the plane, you'll make it. Well, it's not enough just to believe in the parachute. Yes, this parachute will probably save me and I'm going to have it in the seat with me and the plane goes down, I'm going to crash and die. Um, but what I need to do is I need to put that parachute on, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to put him on. I need to believe in him and put my trust in him. So if a universalism is a true doctrine, then uh, we would have to throw out Jesus' teaching on narrow is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, few who find it. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus um, who can be saved, he replied, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible, Luke 1, 37. Only those who come to faith by Christ will be assured of salvation. And it, you know, it can be a huge stumbling block to actual you know, assurance of actual salvation as this, this idea of easy believism or universalism. You know, we're putting all our confidence in ourselves. Um, you know, the focus of those who have the false assurance tends to be on self, works, Prayers, again, I prayed that prayer, confidence in ourselves. Well, I'm, you know, he's got to let me in. I've heard, you know, other people refer to it in that way. Well, you know what I, I told God, you know, that he's going to let me in. It's like, you don't tell God that. If we look to the past, like an experience, a prayer, or, you know, write a date in our Bible, again, these can all be good things, but if it's just that and that alone, um, there's going to be a lack of present, there's usually a lack of present evidence that we have a mark, and it should cause us to question ourselves and to seek God. Um, you know, to combat this idea of, you know, easy believism or like self works or things to do to um, earn salvation, you know, we look at Ephesians 2 8 and 9. You know, it's for grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of ourselves, it's the gift of God so that no one may boast. You know, we boast in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, you know? Um, this idea, too, that we can clean up ourselves and make ourselves presentable to God. Um, he's the one who washes away our sins, and he provides a perfect union for him. Um, in the book, Beakey, uh, Joel Beakey says, false assurance generally leads a person into one or two dead ends. The dead end of sentimental emotion or the dead end of dry intellectualism. So either people are seeking to have their hearts filled with happiness and what they can achieve in this life or going to church and just feeling good about how they're doing or they're always learning or they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's 2 Timothy 3, 7. So true assurance is gospel-based and Bible-tested, okay? Um, I've heard some people say to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Uh, just to remind ourselves of the salvation on which we stand already. It's not a need for a day-to-day -day salvation. I don't need to confess my sins every day in order to, you know, be forgiven eternally, but I want to have a right, right relationship with God. Um, there was a, a time where we first placed our faith in Christ. Okay, that happened. Some, some of us remember the day or the hour or the date. Um, some of us know it was like a season that it happened, but that's the same faith that we have today. It may wax, it may wane, um, but it never disappears if we're truly saved. Okay? It's perseverance. We, we never give up because Jesus, Jesus has us, not because of ourselves. Um, in dealing with this, again, this false, you know, versus true, we should examine ourselves to see whether we, you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? And that's 2 Corinthians 13.5. And what is the test? Um, you know, did we trust Christ and Christ alone for salvation? He died in our place on the cross for our sins. And as Pastor Dom quotes all the time, nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. You know, and true, true assurance can be a huge source of comfort. Again, Beaky on page 18 says, those who have a genuine longing for God and a corresponding hatred for sin 
they will acknowledge that these things, um, the assurance, will be, are worked by the Holy Spirit in them, and they are comforted by them. We know the marks in our lives, the fruit of the evidence of our salvation, and that will help us to be assured. So why is assurance even important to really have? Um, it's for our, like our own sanity and our internal peace with God. Okay, we know, when we know that we know that we are God's children, you know, and we have by faith in his son, we can rest soundly at night. We don't have to walk in doubt. We don't have to live with, you know, wondering if we die tonight, you know, are we gonna go to heaven? Um, we can live vibrant lives. We can live a life out of thanksgiving, not trying to earn God's salvation, but out of thanksgiving for what he has already done for us. We can have communion with God. We have a closeness with him. You know, in the book, again, he talks about the relationship that God describes when he talks about intimacy with his people. He talks about father and child. He talks about husband and wife. He talks about the bridegroom and the bride, the head and the body. This is not a casual relationship at all. You know, it's very close. And also personal holiness, you know, that's, that's important in our life. When we have assurance, we desire to live more holy lives. You know, we grieve after our sin. We want to live pleasing lives to God, again, as an offering to what God has already done for us. Uh, 1 John 3.3 3 says that every man that has this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he is pure. You know, might I suggest, you know, we've been referencing the book of 1 John uh, just to read that, and we can see how can we be assured and that we belong to God. If you just read the book of 1 John, as, as Pastor Dom said this morning, it's two believers, and there's all kinds of different marks in there that says, you know, how can I know that I am saved? You know, we look at our evidence in there, in the book of 1 John, and I think there's, there, there's a number of them, 7, 8, 10, I'm not sure. Um, you know, why is it important? Well, to be serving in the church and in the world. You know, God called us to be light to the world, you know, and to be serving one another. You know, as, and it's, again, in the book, it talks about an assured Christian is an active Christian. You know, we're living out our life. We're reading our Bible. We're serving in the church, serving others in our community. We're serving our family, um, just being used of God. Um, 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Um, I'm going to read a quote, too, that talks about just the, sometimes the danger in this doubting and questioning um, that sometimes goes on when we talk about, do I have assurance, do I, do I not? On page 20, J.C. Ryle, there's a quote from him that he states that a believer who lacks an assured hope. Again, he says a believer, so he lacks assurance, but he, he, he does know the Lord. A believer who lacks an assured hope will spend much of his time in inward searching of heart about his, in, his own state. Like a nervous, hypochondriacal person, he will be full of his own ailments, his own doubtings and questionings, his own conflicts and corruptions. In short, you will often find that he is so taken up with his internal welfare that he has little leisure for other things and little time for the work of God. So just always self-focused on that. And so there's the danger. We need to be careful not to give in to doubt so much as to whether we're clinging on to Jesus enough. Um, rather, we should be assured that he is clinging on to us. Um, it's important about the, further, the furtherance of the Christian message and doctrine, you know. We continually need to hear the message of salvation, you know, and, and that working out in our lives. It helps to promote that which we already know and believe. And why? Because there's so much opposition in the world and so much false things that are being shared, so much lies in the world, and the very idea that even truth even exists, you know, can it be found? Um, and we can be grounded in the Word of God, and as Pastor Dom alluded to this morning again, the God of the Word. Um, we, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, Titus 1.9. Sorry. 
Okay, so why do many lack assurance? Um, again, in the book, he talks about at the beginning of this one chap chapter two, he talks about just, um, just the idea that some people should have assurance, but they don't get it. And some people want to have assurance, but they can't get it. Um, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but he talks about how some professing Christians think that it's, you know, in, think they have it in their lives when they, they show that they don't have it. Okay, people say, well, yeah, I know the Lord, but you don't see evidence of it in their life. You know, their presumption paves the road for hell for them. I think some of us have heard that, you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to trust God one day. Um, if they say they never wrestle with assurance, they mean what they say. They, they don't, probably. They don't think about it at all. They don't think about their relationship with God. Um, and then other people, they long to have assurance, but they can't seem to find it or embrace it. They may have the evidence and the truth of it, but they just struggle with it. Like I said, am I doing enough to know that, I'm, that I am God's? Um, you know, they, they talk about the going at the, you know, going to sleep at night. Do, do I love the Lord or not? Am I his or not? Just this questioning that we have in our, in our hearts. Um, some have struggled for years, even decades, and they feel no further along. And, you know, and again, he says he writes this book for them. So why do some lack assurance? Well, sin, plain and simple, okay? Sin in the past, the painful memory of the things of which we already have repented. You know, I, this, this, this false idea, and I've heard it so many times, and I have to combat it here from, from this platform, that, yeah, I know that Jesus forgave me, but I, but I haven't forgiven myself. Almost as if, like, you know, Jesus' forgiveness is not enough, that we have to do, you know, we have to add to it. Um, it should cause us to tremble that, that we need to supersede in order to be forgiven. You know, Jesus himself, speaking about forgiveness, um, he says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's John 8, 35. So what he has already done, yes, we, do, we may be sorrow after things we've done. We may still grieve the, the sins that we've done, and we've already repented of it. You know, there's still consequences for those things. You know, uh, David, when he sins with Bathsheba, and he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. And there was consequences for that, family consequences for him. Um, but he had already been forgiven. He went to the Lord, asked for forgiveness, and had that right relationship. Um, there's also the painful realization of sins of which we have not yet repented. So we struggle in many ways. We struggle because we're still doing a particular sin or we're still you know, caught up in some kind of just yeah, habitual sin that we just can't get rid of for whatever reason. You know, you know Jesus talked about you know, his struggle against sin, you know, his temptation, you know, and in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 4, you know, the author talks about our struggle against sin. Are we struggling against sin? Are we struggling in sin? Um, it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And so Jesus is our high priest. We can go to him at any point. You know, in our struggle against sin, we need to invite him in to help us in that. Um, it also, in that passage right before, it talks about speaking of not growing weary in our walk or in our lives. Um, and also, when we are, have sin in the presence, you know, in the present time, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, you know? Oh, you don't belong to him because you're doing this, or you're thinking this, or you're doing that, or you're not doing that. So Satan is always accusing us, um, Revelation 12.10. So, in the book, too, he talks about his goal, Satan's goal is to influence us to fear that we have sinned too much. Well, God would never, you know, he has forgiven me, but, you know, maybe I've messed it up. Maybe I can lose my salvation, which is not in the Bible. You know, sometimes we have this false view of God and the gospel, you know, that, you know, again, that Jesus' forgiveness isn't enough. And sometimes we elevate experience and emotion over God's truth. Um, and that can be sin in the presence. Also, speaking about sin in the presence and, and, and Satan saying, well, you, you've sinned. Well, sometimes we give him a lot of material, you know? Are we living lives that are holy? Are we uh, saying no to sin? Are we trying to live righteous lives? Um, 
Yeah, it's Jesus' blood and his righteousness, not us alone, that is providing salvation. Um, uh, when we sin, not if we sin, because we are going to sin, when we sin, it causes us to doubt. But when we realize that sinners sin, you know, it gives us not a free pass or anything like that. We don't take it lightly, but we take it to the Lord. I think sometimes we get, and I can obviously attest to that, you know, and caught up in sin, and you keep making the same mistakes or whatever, you're grieving, but then take it to the Lord. That's what he wants us to do. You know, he's the source and the provider of forgiveness. So what's the antidote to this poison of just this lack of assurance that we have? Well, the gospel. The gospel changes us. So every time we come to be together with other believers, whether it's here, whether it's we, you know, have some small group or just getting together with friends that are believers, we continue to preach the gospel to one another. You know, we continue to listen to it and hear it and read about it all the time. And the gospel is changing us. It's this idea of sanctification. You know, we're forgiven at the point of coming to faith in him and trusting in him. And then we continue to walk out our life with him. And we progress in our walk with him until he calls us home. Um, again, the same idea about preaching the gospel to ourselves. Did I believe in him for salvation? I need to continually trust him, you know? I don't worry that if I stop trusting him, then he'll let me go. He remains faithful, you know? We cling to the one who provided unbreakable promises. And we could have wrong thoughts about, you know, the gospel. Uh, Romans 8, I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans 8, uh, 31 to 39, we're going to read. Speaking of, you know, our relationship with Christ and, uh, you know, are we with him? Is he for us? Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him over for us all, how will we not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who, con who, is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all these doubts we have, all these things, all these external things in our life, what's going to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Jesus Christ is the one who brings us to God. He's the one who's the way to the Father. He's the one who draw, drew, you know, the Spirit draws him. You know, we are his through faith in Christ. We are God's. You know, the anchor of Paul's assurance here is knowing that God is for us. And the center of Paul's thinking or, uh, is not in himself. It is God. It's Paul's concept that God has given rise uh, to his assurance. Um, you know, we need to be careful, too, this failure to confess Christ. You know, 1 John 4.15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Again, that 1 John, you know, there's another reference to that 1 John book. I think I'll make it a little plug here for you, Dom, Pastor Dom, to do that later. You've got to cover that book. <clears throat> and perhaps your refusal to go public with your faith uh, is in making you wonder that your faith is real. So uh, before I get ready to tap out into Pastor Dom cover the next part, um, I want to read a question from page 38 of, of the book uh, that's just good to ponder. The author says this, The question you need to ask is, have I, by God's grace, through faith and repentance, Come to Christ for salvation, and have I found that salvation in Him alone? 
I think it's a necessary question. It's one worth pondering today. Wow, awesome. I think another reason why many of us lack assurance is that we're simply negative in our personalities or critical in our minds. And because of that, a lot of times we may ignore the good signs. We may ignore what God is actually doing. Some of us, for whatever reason, whether it's the way we were raised or just the way we were made, have a hard time thinking well of ourselves. And so if you fit into that category today, I have good news for you. It's not about you. Our assurance has very little to do with us and everything to do with God, as Chris just said. We know, believers, that God is for us. If God is for us, even if we're against us, it doesn't matter, right? Amen. So let me encourage you not to ignore the good signs. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, we, we find this passage. So turn with me, if you would, there. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. It's a very famous, well-known passage, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, where it says this. It says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The, the sad reality, friends, is that some of you will never feel good about yourselves. And there's good to that, and there's bad to that. Because you may be torturing your own heart because you're refusing to see the positive evidence in your life that God is working. And this is where it's real helpful to, to bring in other parts of your family or your friends and just say, All right, tell me, shoot it straight. Am I different than I was five years ago? And if, if they are paying attention and if they really want to help your soul, my guess is that would, they would say, in some ways, yes. And they'll list about a dozen things, and then they'll hit you with a couple of the things that you still need to grow in, right? The problem is we're all kind of a mixed bag. But don't ignore, if you're going to listen to the negatives in your life, don't ignore the positives. If God is working in you, Notice his work, okay? I think you'll be greatly blessed by that. In Matthew chapter 5, you don't need to turn there because I want to be quick, uh, sword drills and all. But in Matthew uh, chapter 5, it lists all these things. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's amazing to me how some people will come to me in absolute poverty of spirit. They'll come to me and they go, Dom, I'm struggling. Oh, I'm, I'm such a horrible Christian. And I try and I can't obey and I have nothing to offer this God. Is there anything you can say to help me? Answer, no, but Jesus did. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? When you feel horrible, there's something beautiful about that. Because when we throw ourselves at the foot of Christ, Christ shines and encourages us. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I love this. People come to me and they say, I want to obey. I want to honor Christ. But I, I, I just can't seem to do that perfectly. Is there something wrong with me? Answer, yes. And no. Sin is wrong with you, but that hunger for righteousness is the best thing about us. Let that encourage you. If you're going to let the sin in your life discourage you, let the growth in your life encourage you. Another way, and, and there's so much more here, but again, I, I want to be, I want to be brisk in my uh, tempo here. One of the other common reasons why I think people struggle with assurance is because they don't remember their conversion. 
<laughs> okay, now make me feel better. Have you ever heard one of these great conversion testimonies where somebody stands up and they say, you know, I was part of the mafia or I, I uh, was part of the Third Reich or all this other stuff and I'm killing people left and right and then one day I heard the angel singing, right? And, and everybody's like, wow. And you feel like a loser, right? Because you prayed to receive Christ when you were four at Awana. And what you don't realize is that everybody who led a life of sin and then got converted would gladly trade places with you. The Bible says this, what benefit are you now deriving of the things of which you're ashamed? If I had the option, I would trade places. I would have become a Christian when I was four. But the problem is, is many of you don't remember when you were four. And if you don't remember your conversion, you may wonder, was it real? Did I mean it? Or was it to get the Twinkie at the end of Vacation Bible School? See, when you don't remember your conversion, you may begin to doubt it. But there's a fix for that. It's a glorious and wonderful fix. First of all, it's common to feel that way. But secondly, this is fixable. Are you ready? It doesn't matter when you got saved. It matters if you got saved. And if you don't know that you're saved, then get saved. Who cares? When you see Christ or whoever it is that greets you at the gates, whether they're pearly or not, whatever questions you are asked, I guarantee it will not be on the test whether you know the day or time when you were converted. Because I'll suggest to you that none of us really do. In John chapter 3, it says we don't see the wind, right? We see the effects of the wind. We see praying a prayer, walking an aisle, breaking our hearts, tears down our face. But what we don't realize is the Holy Spirit has already worked. So don't be hung up on, I think I did it when I was four. It's not a question of what you did. It's a question of what you are doing. Are you trusting Christ? Is he the center of your hope? Is he the highest and most beautiful focus of your affections? Who cares? I've seen so many people struggle with knowing they need to turn their lives to the Lord, but they just can't admit it might have been fake when they were three. Right? See, I love it. It feels like the end of a sitcom in the 80s, right? Now, here's a very special message from Pastor Don. No, it's, the whole point is this. It doesn't matter if you know the day, the time, and the location. What matters is, do you know Christ? There's no, you don't get extra credit if it's been 20 years. You don't get extra credit if it's been 20 minutes. A last thing that we'll talk about a little bit this morning is simply this, spiritual warfare. An assured Christian leads a life of dependence. What does this mean? This means that the Christian life is not one straight victory. It is an overwhelming victory that shows itself in a million tiny defeats. When we blow it, when we lose it, when we make a misstep and it forces us to throw ourselves on the mercy of Christ, Christ is glorified. And the devil hates that. The one thing that we know that Satan hates more than anything else is the glory of Christ. It was his own, that Satan's, hubris and arrogance that caused him to fall in the first place. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is the hater of souls, and he loathes our God. But an assured Christian leads a life of dependence. He understands that if I am to live the way you want me to live, Lord, I need your power to do it. Secondly, an assured Christian leads a life of humility. Friends, how many of you really feel like you are the perfect Christian that everyone should model their lives after? 
And if you thought that, would you be so bold as to raise your hand? <laughs> We've all met people who, who seem to think they're God's gift to Christians. And they never wonder if they're saved. In their false assurance, they think Jesus is lucky to have them. Just like the people in Matthew 7 who cried out to Jesus and said, didn't we do the miraculous? All in your name? And Jesus said to them, depart from me. I never knew you. It's the arrogant the ones who never struggle with whether or not their faith is real that end up showing their faith to be false. Why? Because the devil doesn't bother people like that. They do it themselves. He attacks those of us who are really trying. The devil hates both of these things. He hates a life of dependence in us, and he hates a life of humility in us, and so he attacks us to destroy our assurance. Would you turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Ephesians 6, 11. Those of you who are at children's camp this year, these things will be extraordinarily fresh in your mind as we talk about the armor of God. In Ephesians 6, starting, we'll start in verse 10, it says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in somebody else's strength. That's dependence. That's humility. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You see what it says there? We must put on this armor in order to stand firm against the onslaught of the enemy of souls, which means he will attack us when we want to honor him. He will attack us with what Paul will call his fiery darts. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers and powers, against the world forces of this darkness. It is a spiritual battle. Spiritual battles must be won by spiritual weapons. And spiritual battles are necessary because we have a spiritual enemy. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that the devil roams around like a lion looking for people, what? Anybody? To devour. He hates the Lord of your souls, and he hates your soul for loving him. Now, why is that good news? It's a pretty heavy note to end on, isn't it? Why is that good news? Well, you know, if you're struggling, that you're real. When I was uh, first saved, I was probably a couple of months old in the faith. I was in a bookstore and I was looking at the horror section of the books. Cause I used to love those kind of books when I was a non-believer, new believer. And I remember I, I turned a book over and on the back, it says this, if your heart races, if your pulse quickens, if your skin crawls, rest assured. Cause that means you're still alive. And that stuck with me 20 some years later. But it's true, right? When you're afraid, it means you're alive and you notice there's a danger. Dead people are not afraid. They're dead. And so if you live in the constant struggle to prove your faith real, yes, your heart will ache. Yes, your skin will crawl. Yes, your pulse will quicken. But rest assured, that means you're alive. Now, in the rest of your notes, you'll see before you some optional discussion questions. Now, these are just for your enjoyment. And uh, I wrote, I think, some of these, not all of these. If you hate these, don't tell us. Just, just keep that to yourself. But if they're a benefit to you, maybe think about these things through the week. And let me encourage you, if you want to, to buy a copy of the book and, and dig a little bit deeper. Uh, you'll notice that next week we'll answer these questions. Can we have assurance? 
And is a sense of assurance always good? That's going to be Jason White. So pray for him as he prepares that. Uh, two weeks from now, we'll talk about sources of assurance. This says part one, but I think it's all parts, sources of assurance. And that's Pastor Rob. So pray for him as he prepares to deliver that to you. And then um, on the 22nd, we'll ask the question, how do we achieve assurance and how do we keep it? And Bob Hammond will be teaching that Sunday. These are heavy, weighty things, right? Well, our time is up. So let me do this. Let me tag one more time. Let's ask um, our brother Chris to come up and close us in prayer. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions later, uh, come see us. We'd love to talk to you more. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, the author of salvation, the perfecter of our faith, we thank you for Jesus, your son, for the fit before the foundations of your world, you saved us. You provided a way of salvation that we never have to question, how do we get to heaven? You provided a way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And those who come through him come to you, God. We also know that you, Jesus said, come all you who are weary and have laden, and you will give them rest. So there's the idea that you provided salvation, but we must come to you by faith. So I pray that you would assure our hearts this morning that we are yours and that, you are, and that you are ours through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And for those who struggle because they don't know you, Lord, would you work in their hearts? Would your spirit so move that they would spend time in your word, that they would spend time with others, getting to know you, understanding how to put their faith and trust in you? And I pray that you continue to help us. We may have family, we may have friends, we may have coworkers that we wanna help in this assurance of salvation. Lord, we can't give it. We would love to say, yes, you're saved, we know that. Only you can do it, Lord, but help us to point them to you. And we give you all the praise through Jesus, amen.